A long, long time ago, the year was 1325. The forests were thick, the Qutub Minar was standing tall in Delhi, and if your neighbours annoyed you, it was perfectly realistic to put a sword right through them, in most cases. I know, good times. People of Delhi and Northern India, by people I mean the nobles who cared about their tender hold on power, mourned the death of a really respected monarch, Sultan Ghiasuddin Tughlaq. Side note. Sultan means king and I'll be using this word throughout because I find it way more regal sounding than the word king. So Mr. Tughlaq had decided to let a big wooden beam fall right over his old head and he died on the spot. But people were sad because he was a genuinely good monarch. He had brought stability back to everything after the descendants of Alauddin Khilji had run it all to the ground. Things had gotten really bad and Ghiasuddin Tughlaq was the one who brought system and safety back. So people actually liked him. But he died. Many chroniclers suggest that he was killed by his own son, Fakhruddin Jona. They believe that Jona deliberately prepared the tent in which his father was sitting in a way that when his father would sit under it, the wooden beam would fall right over his head. This confusion shall remain forever. But it is a perfectly fitting beginning to the story of Muhammad bin Tughlaq and his devastating reign. You see, Fakhruddin Jona now ascended the throne and took the title Muhammad bin Tughlaq and thus started one of the darkest periods of Northern Indian history. Muhammad bin Tughlaq wasn't just bad bad, he was really bad and confusingly bad. He was sometimes good, sometimes monster. Sometimes Gandhi, sometimes that moustache man. Sometimes creamy, sometimes crispy. Sometimes Jekyll, sometimes Hyde. According to every resource of the time, Sultan Muhammad bin Tughlaq was unpredictable, totally bonkers, ravenously bloodthirsty, absolutely sadistic and tyrannical in the punishments he meted out, and sickeningly arrogant. No one knew what to make of him. You can see this best from how his contemporary chroniclers describe him. So well, an early modern historian says that Muhammad was a saint with the heart of a devil or a fiend with the soul of a saint. Ziauddin Barani, who was the official chronicler in Muhammad bin Tughlaq's court, tells us, We were traitors who were prepared to call black white. Avarice and the desire for worldly wealth led us into hypocrisy and as we stood before the king and witnessed punishments forbidden by the law, fear of our fleeting lives and equally fleeting wealth deterred us from speaking the truth before him. Now you might be wondering if Barani is telling the truth, then how could he even write this and still have his head sitting right on his neck? Well, that's because, lucky for us, Barani outlived Muhammad Tughlaq, which means ultimately Barani could write honestly about Muhammad's reign without fearing for his life and wealth anymore. So, yay! He tells us, not a day or week passed without the spilling of much blood. Streams of gore flowed daily before the entrance of his palace. The corpses of those executed were usually flung down at the gate of the royal palace. The famous Ibn Battuta was also at Muhammad's court. He was a Moorish explorer who spent about a decade in India, most of it in Delhi, and most of it at Muhammad's court. Muhammad had even given him an official post and he tells us, The Sultan was far too ready to shed blood. He punished small faults and great, without respect of persons, whether men of learning, piety or high station. Every day, hundreds of people, chained, pinioned and fettered, are brought to his hall and those who are for execution are executed, those for torture are tortured and those for beating are beaten. You'll see in a minute why all of them sound similar. Let's look at some actual incidents from Muhammad bin Tughlaq's life. When his cousin rose in revolt against him, a normal man would have suppressed the rebellion, killed the cousin and moved on with his life. Not Muhammad bin Tughlaq though. Muhammad had his rebellious cousin flayed alive and then he had his flesh cooked with rice and fed it to that dead cousin's wife and children. Welcome to life in Delhi in 1325. One day the son of Qazi, Qazi is the chief justice in the Muslim society. He's a religious leader but decides on civilian disputes like a judge does. So the son of this Qazi, the chief justice, called Muhammad an unjust monarch and Muhammad totally surprised, asked the Qazi's son why he thought so. To this, the Qazi's son replied, When a criminal is brought before you, it is entirely at your royal option to punish him justly or unjustly. But you go further than that, and you give his wife and children to the executioners. In what religion is this practice lawful? If this is not injustice, what is it? You know how Muhammad replied to this? 
he ordered the chief justice's son to be imprisoned in an iron cage. Then he had him cut down into little pieces right in front of his father, the Kazi. Before you start hating him, you should know that one time when a Hindu noble complained to the Kazi, in other words, the chief justice, that Sultan Muhammad had put his brother to death without cause, Muhammad walked on foot and unarmed to the chief justice's court and remained standing while the chief justice gave judgment on the matter. He decided in the Hindu's favor and confirmed that Sultan Muhammad was at fault. How did Muhammad react? He politely paid the fine that he was required to pay as his punishment. Another time, a Muslim claimed that the Sultan owed him money. In this matter too, the Qazi gave judgment against the Sultan for the payment of the debt and Muhammad promptly paid it like a good boy. When a famine broke out in northern India, Muhammad ordered that every person in Delhi, small or great, free man or slave, should be given six months' provision from the royal granary. Like I said, sometimes crispy, sometimes creamy. Muhammad was a rigidly orthodox Muslim, never missed a prayer and punished those who missed the prayers. But as contradictory and wacko as always, he was also a patron of Hindu yogis. He was particularly an ardent fan of the Jain sage Jina Prabhasuri. According to Jain sources, the Sultan treated this Jain sage Jina Prabhasuri with respect, seated him by his side and offered him wealth, land, horses, blah blah, all of which the saint declined. As for his policies, all of his policies failed. Like Alauddin Khilji and Akbar, Muhammad was a compulsive innovator, always coming up with great ideas for reforming. But unlike Alauddin and Akbar, who were both unalphabet by the way, Muhammad was actually a very learned man. He was a great calligrapher, knew Persian poetry by heart and understood quite a bit of astronomy and medicine. Problem is, unlike Alauddin and Akbar, Muhammad Tughlaq didn't understand that to execute any great plans, you have to rally people together, get them organized, be watchful of how it's going, accept faults in the plan and adjust it or abort mission if it's going wrong. Instead, our Muhammad would declare a plan and then killed people right, left and center when anything went even a bit unexpectedly. All of his grand policies and dreams just ended up becoming nightmares for both him and his people. Whenever something went wrong, instead of evaluating his own failings or the failings of his plans, he unleashed his anger on his people because he believed they failed to realize his grand dreams, which turned people against him and him further against his own people. And this wheel of hate only turned faster with time. Ziauddin Barani, that contemporary chronicler, tells us, Muhammad never talked over his projects with any of his counsellors and friends. Whatever he conceived, he considered to be good. But in promulgating and enforcing the schemes, he lost his hold upon the territories he possessed, disgusted his people and emptied his treasury. Embarrassment followed embarrassment and confusion became worse confounded. People hated him. He hated his people. The more policies he introduced and failed at, and he failed at all of them, the more revolts broke out in territories and the more he fought back to suppress those revolts and wasted his resources. Barani says, and he wasn't being funny, the mind of the Sultan then lost its equilibrium. His schemes led to the ruin of his empire and the decay of his people. Every one of his schemes led to some wrong and mischief and the minds of all men, high and low, were disgusted with their ruler. When the Sultan found that his orders did not work as well as he desired, he became still more embittered against his own people and he cut them down like weeds. For example, he wanted to encourage the high-value commercial crops. Good idea. He declared that wheat should be sown instead of barley, sugarcane instead of wheat, grape and date instead of sugarcane, because these were high-value crops. Cool. To help farmers make this change, Muhammad even offered them generous loans. But he did not think this through. Barani, God bless him, tells us, several greedy, impecunious men came forward. Some pledged to bring one lakh of bigas of wasteland under cultivation within three years. They were given not just the money, but also gold embroidered gowns. Because, you know, that's what farmers need. What happened then? The scheme failed miserably. The officers entrusted with the distribution of loans embezzled funds to the point that in two years, seven million tankas had been issued by the treasury for the cultivation of wastelands, but absolutely nothing changed in agriculture. Yet another genius move of Muhammad's was to raise the taxes on the cultivators only in the Dawab region because Dawab had richer lands, so higher agricultural yields. But was the 5-10% to tax increase based on actual yields? No, it was based on standard yield, which means even when the yield was low because of bad weather, farmers still had to pay the increased taxes. 
not just those but also the new cattle tax and the house tax a horrified barani writes cultivators there were impoverished and reduced to beggary but muhammad was unconcerned and he despite the all too evident problems that his tax measures caused gradually extended them to a wider area of his empire what happens when you drive people against the wall people in several places rose in rebellion against these exacting oppressive measures of the sultan in the dawab farmers burnt their corn stacks and turned their cattle out to roam at large instead of stopping and listening to why his people were so upset and revising his tax policies what did muhammad do he responded by laying waste to the country killing landlords and village chiefs and blinding others he gave orders that every peasant should be put to death and that the whole country should be ravaged and indiscriminately plundered he himself marched out and put to the sword all the remaining population and ordered their heads to be displayed from the battlements of the fort in this way he utterly depopulated whole tracts of his kingdom and inflicted such rigorous punishment that the whole world was aghast barani tells us what happened next a drought according to some records it was a 7 year long drought this obviously created an acute shortage of food barani says this produced a fatal famine in delhi and its environs and throughout the dawab it continued for some years and thousands upon thousands of people perished all cultivation was abandoned man was devouring man ibn batuta even records that he once saw some women stripping off the skin of a long dead horse and eating it In one place a man was found cooking a human foot cannibalism became common guess what did muhammad do seeing his people in misery he ordered grain to be issued to people from the royal granary and he set up public kitchens to feed the destitute told ya unpredictable because his treasury was running into deficit muhammad introduced token currency which means he issued brass or copper coins and they were to be treated of the same value as the silver and gold coins just like our paper money these days this was a great idea actually china and persia were already doing it but they had an effective system to prevent counterfeiting not muhammad though the token coins that muhammad issued were easily counterfeited every goldsmith basically everyone who could started minting millions and millions of copper coins sometimes right inside their own homes with these coins they paid their taxes and purchased homes arms houses basically everything for literally free barani says the village headmen and landowners grew rich and strong upon these copper coins but the state was impoverished the common people soon recognized this and stopped accepting copper coins in their transactions but the government unaware continued accepting taxes and copper and brass coins as a result Barani says the treasury was filled with copper coins so low did they fall in value that they were not valued more than pebbles when muhammad found out about it how did he react in great wrath and without thinking it through yet again he proclaimed that whoever possessed copper coins should bring them to the treasury and receive gold and silver coins in exchange effectively this meant that the government now purchased copper at the price of silver or gold thousands of people who had these copper coins and counterfeiters especially brought their coins to the treasury and received gold and silver coins in return so many of these copper coins were brought to the treasury that heaps of them rose up in tughlaqabad like mountains the abject failure of the token currency project further embittered muhammad and he more than ever turned against his subjects Since after all these failures Muhammad still wasn't convinced that he should just stop and go and drink like other boys his age he took another great decision to move his capital from Delhi to Devagiri which was more centrally located for his empire and was further away from the Mongol risk which he should have simply just done you know moving his palace and court from Delhi to Devagiri but since half of his life's mission was to piss his own people off and make their lives miserable he commanded that every single person in delhi was to move with him to devagiri regardless of their profession or family ties to delhi or simply regardless of whether they wanted to move or not this was a hugely unpopular decision and further alienated people from him all in all it was a bloody episode where people who had lived in delhi for centuries were heartbroken at having to leave their ancestral homes and to move to a new place Delhi from being one of the largest cities in the world on par with Baghdad and Cairo now became a ghost town and Devagiri while full became a city full of resentful and mourning hearts after a few years as expected everyone moved back to Delhi and Muhammad failed yet again continuing his long standing series of big dreams and no plans our dear Muhammad Tughlaq decided that he wanted to rule the world the whole world 
and so serious was he about it that he recruited a vast army of 370,000 cavalry which was maintained by him for over a year but was not deployed in any campaign so that when the next year came round there were not sufficient funds in the treasury to support them and so they were disbanded. The Sultan, however, did launch a military campaign into the western Himalayan foothills, perhaps in preparation for an invasion into Central Asia. But this turned out to be an absolute disaster, as heavy rains impeded the army's progress and diseases ravaged soldiers and horses. Beset by these troubles, the hapless army retreated in disorder, and they were then brutally set on by the local people. The whole force was thus destroyed, and out of all this chosen body of men, only 10 horsemen returned to Delhi to tell the news. The net result of Muhammad's plans for foreign conquests was that, in Barani's words, the coveted countries were not acquired, but those which he possessed were lost, and his treasure, which is the true source of political power, was expended. And that was the nutshell of Muhammad bin Tughlaq's reign. He died on 20th March 1351 after ruling for 26 years, which were a horrifying 26 years for everyone, him and his people.